I'm very honored to be invited to this symposium uh, for two reasons. First, uh, I think we have never met before, before yesterday evening. And secondly, I think I'm the only speaker coming from abroad. Uh, but uh, from my uh, presentation, uh, you'll learn that uh, I have been strongly inspired, not only by the specific uh, work of John, but also uh, the way I work. So I will start my uh, talk with this uh, slide on uh, overhead, uh, stating that many people are uh, claiming that we are in a sunset industry, that the chemical process industry is uh, very mature. For sure, it's correct that uh, there's not much uh, going on in terms of new investments, in particular in this country. Uh, also, it's very difficult to come with other than marginal improvements to the existing big processes because the risk of introducing new technology has become bigger and bigger with the scale of operation and with the complexity of plants. So uh, one could be uh, very pessimistic if that is uh, uh, what you want to do. But uh, I think there are plenty of challenges, also challenges different from so-called environmental constraints or objectives. There are many big uh, jobs uh, for the chemical process industry and thereby for catalysis uh, to be solved in our immediate future. I will talk about one of these, and that is the conversion of natural gas. Uh, <coughs> and for sure there has been a lot of attempts. Uh, there has been a lot of attempts to convert natural gas directly uh, uh, to find alternatives to the syngas route, which is claimed to be inefficient and uh, very expensive. In a way, the syngas uh, indirect route is very efficient uh, from a thermal uh, point of view, and uh, this is not the least because of the very high carbon efficiency uh, from uh, this route. You will see that. Uh, we have all the, the synth fuels and, uh, diff uh, and interesting uh, petrochemical products. Um, you'll also notice uh, dimethylether, which uh, was an intermediate in the mobile MTG process we heard about yesterday, but it is also an excellent uh, substitute for diesel with essentially no pollution. You can use it without changing the diesel engine. Fisher Troughs has come up uh, and is very much discussed. The synfuel discussion has been revived. Synfuels were almost killed when uh, President Reagan took office for two, two weeks. We had people coming to the stage for a project meeting, but the office was closed, uh, so they were turning it. So, what's new in synfuels? There are two uh, aspects uh, which makes it uh, becoming of some interest again. First, there's the environmental objective with the title specs on fuels. That means that uh, since the synth fuels are sold for free, they have, if nothing else, just a blending value. So there is a value uh, at the top of the, of the fuel value. And then, of course, in many places in the world, it is uh, not legal, uh, <coughs> not possible anymore uh, to flare uh, natural gas. What's new uh, otherwise is that uh, we are able to design uh, these plants at a much larger scale uh, than uh, uh, we did in the past. In fact, you can design today one single line, a plant like the New Zealand plant, but, uh, in, in double size. It means equivalent to roughly 10,000 uh, tons of methanol per day can be designed for single stream operation. That means that if it was for diamonds a leader, the, the costs of making that would be reduced by 20-25% compared with a thousand ton per day uh, operation. Much of that is the economy of scale in the syngas manufacture, and that in particular is that you go away from the tubular reforming and use orthothermal reform, because the oxygen plant has a much more favorable uh, economy of scale than tubular reform. But having mentioned the tubular reform, uh, I have to stop there. So I will uh, concentrate on uh, the innovation around the tubular reforming process. 
This is an exciting process uh, from an engineering point of view. It's a question of coupling the heat transfer with the catalytic reaction. If uh, the catalyst is not active enough, the tubes will heat up and, uh, and melt. Uh, most catalysts can uh, uh, manage that. The, the big problem in uh, reforming is uh, not the catalyst activity, but its selectivity, meaning that it should not form carbon. If you form carbon in these tubes, you can easily imagine uh, maldistribution of flow overheating at the two balls. We uh, know quite a bit about uh, the mechanism of this carbon formation and uh, uh, we work on it and uh, Terry Baker has also studied, you see these uh, carbon fibers uh, with a little crystal at the top. The hydrocarbon will dissociate on the surface and be dissolved in the nickel crystal and when you are above saturation of carbon in the nickel, you will get a nucleation uh, from Surface. You also see a reconstruction of the nickel surface, uh, the nickel crystal. The name of the game in uh, in reforming is really then to identify the carbon limits and to uh, design for that. I will not go into the details, but just because this has a lot to do with reaction engineering, but just show you here a diagram uh, with the thermodynamic carbon limit. Uh, thermodynamic carbon limit dictated uh, from the thermodynamics you have uh, uh, with uh, whisker carbon, which is not the ideal thermodynamics. Uh, this is then a question, how close can you come uh, to this limit uh, without running into carbon? And would you have a possibility of crossing that limit to operate in spite of thermodynamics? We started the reforming reaction. I did uh, work on, on uh, the higher hydrocarbons, the steam reforming on NAFTA many years ago. And uh, uh, I, I choose, because John had published a lot about ethane hydrogenolysis, I choose ethane as uh, my molecule. And uh, for the kinetics, what we did uh, was simply uh, to use the two step kinetics, as uh, Michel mentioned yesterday, for, for the ethane hydrogenolysis, and then uh, adding the steam absorption. And uh, that worked out uh, very well. And it was no surprise when I used um, ethane hydrogenolysis as a probe reaction, meaning carrying out hydrogenolysis tests on the same catalyst uh, as I studied for the reforming. I found this uh, correlation. Here you have uh, the hydrogenolysis to know frequency relative relative to know frequencies uh, to this uh, red spot, measured at 300 degrees centigrade, uh, very much uh, your conditions. And then uh, there's, uh, there's our standard conditions for steam reforming tests, 500 degrees C. And you see over, and these are all label catalysts on various reports, and you see uh, uh, our migrates and activity uh, uh, with correlation uh, with a slope close to one. So uh, uh, I can conclude that, that uh, the SA uh, hydrogenolysis and the SA steam reforming are closely related. What is interesting also is that this green spot is a reference catalyst with addition of alkali. So the, the, the impact of alkali increasing the activity uh, for steam reforming uh, is also present when you uh, start the hydrogenolysis. It means that the impact of alkali in steam reforming is not uh, uh, directly related to the steam. And this has given us some uh, important mechanistic leads. The steam absorption is very important in, uh, <coughs> of course, in dictating, um, uh, in dictating the, the, the risks for carbon. If we take from methane, similar mechanism but the low breakers of carbon carbon bonds, uh, you have the initial, initial uh, absorption with some dehydrogenation and then you have the complete dissociation into absorbed carbon atoms which will be dissolved in the nickel crystal and if you are above uh, saturation here you will nucleate. But you could operate uh, uh, constantly with some carbon dissolved in the nickel. It's just a question whether you nucleate the carbon. And then of course uh, you have the gasification if you solve this with a lot of assumptions, uh, you can say that the steady state activity of carbon, uh, 
whether that is the bar one or the lower one, uh, can be expressed by this. It means that in order to, to reduce carbon formation, of course, we should have a big concentration and absorb oxygen atoms on the surface. Uh, we should uh, have a big uh, rate constant for the gasification. But we can see uh, if we can if we can reduce this constant, the complete dissociation into carbon atoms, we could also achieve something. I will come back to that. Now, uh, how could we then, uh, having understood this mechanism, how could we then block the carbon formation? Uh, yeah, I have made a simple uh, model of this. Yeah, first, uh, one could say, let us choose a method where carbon will not dissolve. And uh, that is obvious uh, with the noble metals, except for Pelagium. And surely it works. Here <coughs> you see uh, a nickel on magnesium oxide with the same loading of thinking on magnesium oxide. These are TGA studies, reducing steam reforming, uh, very low steam to carbon ratio. And you see that uh, the noble metal catalysts will not form code. The literature present is full of studies. Uh, uh, confirming this uh, statement, and that has been known, I think, for the last 20 years. Uh, but uh, CO2 reforming is very fascinating, and a lot of studies uh, have been carried out uh, uh, with uh, noble metals. But uh, nothing wrong with that, because uh, that has really uh, given a big input from the academic uh, side uh, to the understanding of steam reforming, which otherwise was studied primarily uh, in industry. Um, Another way of, of solving uh, this carbon formation problem would be uh, to poison the catalyst. Let us uh, take uh, this over there. Uh, at normal conditions, uh, you have a few sulfur atoms uh, on the surface, uh, in collision with the sulfur in the, in the gas phase, and uh, you will then get the dissociation of the methane and full dissociation and nucleation of the whisper, as I said before. That can be blocked completely if you sulfur poison the catalyst and you, get, you create the monolayer of sulfur on the liquid surface. But unfortunately, you will have no steam reforming as well. So when you start taking sulfur atoms <coughs> off uh, this, you could speculate that if I took one <coughs> sulfur atom out of the surface, would I get carbon? Probably not. A few more. And uh, then, uh, at one point, maybe you could form the CHX radical, uh, but not the full, uh, the, the full uh, dissociated uh, methane, and then you could have the reaction running. This was the idea, and uh, we, uh, were, we uh, were supported very much by progress in surface science, um, describing very precisely the, the relation between H2S and hydrogen in the gas phase and uh, the sulfur coverages. And a lot of these uh, uh, high vacuum work in the about 1970 and uh, further on uh, was uh, confirmed, uh, uh, has been confirmed now by uh, Scannington uh, electron microscope that you form these two dimensional nickel sulfides. This is a, uh, a picture of, a, of the sulfur. salts on a, on a nickel surface. Uh, also, we saw that uh, if we had a partial blockage of sulfur uh, on the nickel surface, we didn't get a uh, whisker. We got another form of carbon. And uh, we call it octopus carbon because it somehow reminded us uh, of an octopus. They had no formation of solid whisker. You had a lot of thin whiskers growing up from the surface of the crystal, and you had no reconstruction. So uh, we uh, developed uh, uh, the ideas to, to, uh, to run with a party sulfur poison catalyst. And it was also confirmed by GTA. Uh, the experiments carried out at the same time as we measured the reforming rate. Note that we have a completely different scale here and here for the carbon rate. But you see that uh, the dependency on the free nickel surface uh, is <coughs> so, the, so the power is close to 3, and for the uh, carbon formation, so the power goes to, to, to 6.5. Uh, in terms of a simple max state correlation, it would mean that you need roughly 
the three atoms, the reforming reaction, and uh, six to seven for uh, the carbon formation. But a more uh, uh, detailed analysis uh, showed us that these ensembles are, are uh, much more complicated. Here you see the ensemble for, for the uh, reforming, for the message dissociation, and here the, the ensemble size for, uh, for the carbon formation. You have the six to seven uh, sulfur atoms which could uh, block Um, with this knowledge, I would say, about what is going on uh, on the uh, atomic level, on the molecular level, with this input from surface science, uh, we then had the courage to jump and to tell our process engineers that the way to avoid carbon would be to add sulfur to the feet. And for 20, 30, 40 years, they had been designing desulfurization units and been taught if you have sulfur in the field, you will, you will uh, get uh, thermal cracking and cook. Uh, so uh, uh, with this uh, uh, knowledge, uh, we could convince people uh, to make the jump, and we uh, tested uh, this in our full-size molecule color plant we have done in Houston, and uh, it proved to be true. We were also able to convince Monsanto and later on Sterling and uh, the, this uh, uh, system was introduced to one of the big reformers for the acidic acid production. It ran roughly 10 years, but now the reformer has been closed down. So by th this sulfur passivated reforming, we were able to break the sort of dynamic barrier. We were able to operate deep into uh, the, the, the uh, zone where some of the dynamics would predict carbon. And that's simply because we inhibited the creation See, you can operate at a very low uh, CO2 methane ratios and uh, low uh, steam to carbon ratios. In fact, the Sterling plant uh, was operating, I think, very close to around, around the point C. This was uh, one principle, but it was obvious having uh, uh, achieved this by ensemble control. And having uh, read uh, the papers of uh, John Sinfeld and others, why not do it uh, in, uh, by bimetallic catalysis? Why should we use sulfur? It would be much more elegant uh, to do it uh, in a bimetallic way. Recently, we uh, uh, have had, or we have had many years collaboration with the Losco group at the Technical University of Denmark, and uh, they. Um, they have started the methane activation on nickel gold uh, surfaces. Gold uh, uh, does not dissolve the nickel, so you are able to really uh, have uh, the gold concentrated on the surface and also to control the coverages. And uh, in, uh, again, in the uh, scanning tunnel, in the electron microscope, got up by the Lexcorp in Denmark, you can see that the black spots are the gold. Uh, and you see the yellow, and that is just a hole in the link surface. Okay. And then you have uh, that, that uh, the surrounding link atoms uh, hit another uh, color, uh, they are somehow quenched. You can see uh, a model of this and uh, uh, how the methane is can be solved. Uh, what is more interesting is uh, the result of the uh, calculation using this uh, density functional theory, which I will not be able to explain you. But what you see is that uh, you have the red curve, that is, uh, that is a nickel one on one surface. But if you add uh, gold, if you have one gold neighbor, uh, the, the uh, activation energy, uh, let's say an activation, will increase. If you have two gold neighbors, it increases even more. What is interesting is that if you add Cover, it decreases. It's in contrast with the <coughs> deep end theory. But uh, it is not just a question of D electrons, it's also a question of, of uh, the size of the atoms and, and many other things. Uh, but this is an interesting result. It would mean that, uh, that maybe we achieve uh, uh, 
only a part of dissociation of, uh, as I may say, not so full. This we tested again in CGA. <coughs> and, uh, normally, uh, we will run at a sequence of two single ratio of 1.5, and then, uh, and then uh, we will have carbon at a temperature of, say, 520 to 200 the temperature. But with this nickel alloy, we uh, uh, nickel uh, gold alloy, uh, we saw no uh, carbon formation. We had to, to decrease the steep to carbon ratio, and when we were around 0.8, the temperature was increased, and then around this point, we got uh, the, starting, uh, the start of the carbon formation. It shows that, uh, that uh, with the nickel gold system, it's possible to achieve uh, this ensemble effect. Uh, and I think the ensemble effect is the combination um, <coughs> of the ge geometric uh, blockage and uh, the electronic impact on the nearest neighbors. It's also interesting that the work we did with our Portuguese friends on the methane decomposition of the copper catalysts uh, also confirms uh, what uh, these calculations show. Again, we have uh, we have the rate curve, this uh, nickel or silica catalyst. We have the uh, methane decomposition rate here. And uh, if we have only uh, one percent of carbon in the nickel, we have an enhancement of the rate. If we uh, if we add more carbon, then uh, we get uh, a blockage uh, or uh, an inhibition of the, of the carbon formation. Uh, we saw very much in the beginning that this would be the solution, but, uh, but unfortunately it doesn't work, and that is also because something which was mentioned yesterday as a result of, of John's work, that is not just a question of adding more carbon to the nickel, nickel and carbon forms are almost an ideal alloy, but the surface composition is independent of what you have in the bulk, and you are not able to, to design the catalyst that you have a sufficiently high carbon coverage on the surface. So you can't eliminate uh, the carbon formation by addition of uh, carbon. This, uh, uh, of course, uh, is, uh, is uh, very exciting that we have had this combination of uh, studying the fundamental research, uh, the fundamental uh, of, uh, of uh, the reaction at the same time as uh, making uh, uh, the scale up. Uh, at Topso, we believe very much in this approach that uh, you should uh, understand what you are doing and able to have the courage uh, to, to jump. And also, the knowledge, the, the more knowledge you have, the more concepts you have, uh, the, the more basis you have to be creative. Uh, now, uh, if we look at uh, where we stand in, in catalysis and uh, how good we are at, uh, uh, at innovating, I would like to state that uh, the, the fundamental catalysis uh, is very close to two traps. The first trap is that we very often see catalysis degenerating into the noble art of characterization. The people are characterizing materials, and uh, I would say <coughs> uh, that uh, the chemical reaction. Uh, is still a very good way of characterizing catalysts and one should encourage more to, to use the concept of probe reactions instead of uh, uh, getting uh, deeper, deeper into characterization. I'm not saying any against, anything against characterization, but characterization alone will not bring you much. The other trap, that is the noble art of modeling. Particular 10 years ago or 15 years ago, uh, you could only you could only be a, a respectable chemical engineer if you were able to make the differential equations uh, very complicated and be sure all the, the, the constants uh, should not have any dimension. And uh, you see many young engineers today sitting in front of the computer and modeling and modeling, and that uh, uh, takes them a long, long way from from uh, the reality of life. Uh, which really starts uh, by climbing around in the power plant, as we also heard about yesterday, and um, uh, to, to achieve 
what uh, Jim Cusumano says, uh, the, the practical insight in, in the problem. The worst thing is that if your work is uh, focusing on uh, building up your private cathedral to design experiments to prove that you are right, and uh, also uh, having the hope that by uh, computers, by fundamental characterization, you are able to design catalysts. I do not believe at all in that. Uh, irrespective of all the knowledge you have about uh, the zoology, and the animals and so on, you were not able to predict that there were kangaroos in Australia. And having assumed that there were kangaroos, uh, found that there were kangaroos in Australia, it would have been a completely wrong conclusion that they would also have been in New Zealand. And my fundamental uh, or basic uh, concept of catalysis is that there are still a lot of discoveries that should be made uh, in uh, solid materials. It would be extremely dangerous if everything we wanted to study should be within the cathedral. Um, having said that, we also want to say that with all our fundamental knowledge, we have an extremely strong tool to navigate when we have a catalyst in our hands. But that's two different things. The thing that uh, we need very much in our research to, to identify where's the cliff. That is what we did with, uh, with uh, our carbon formation studies. We, uh, we approached the thermodynamic limit, we went across it, we found the real carbon boundaries, and uh, knowing where a cliff is, it's not that dangerous to walk here. But if you don't know where a cliff is, if it's all foggy well, then, uh, then uh, it, it would be dangerous even to walk in here. So uh, in, our, uh, in our research and development uh, work, we should always try what, to identify <coughs> what is, what, what is uh, the the cliff, how far can we go? Um, yesterday we heard something from Sharon. What I'm saying here is very much the same thing. Uh, it's uh, all circling around. Uh, hopefully something precipitating. But the way we work is very much that we use the basic research as an integrated part of our development work. Uh, of course, it gives us ideas to catalyst formulation, although they are not designed by the computer. And uh, we scale up at uh, the pilot plants, and then we use very much the fundamental characterization methods in characterizing spec patterns. That is uh, really uh, a gold mine of information. And uh, uh, the best experimental unit to have is really uh, the industrial uh, unit, uh, because they have more time to follow operating hours. So uh, spending a lot of time on studying that. Uh, the sintering, the poisoning, the structure the changes is, uh, of course, uh, a, a key element. So the, the basic research should never be allowed in an industrial environment to be isolated and just uh, do uh, uh, blue sky research. It should certainly be integrated also in the development world. <coughs> this philosophy has led us to, to this approach that rather than using bench scale units, where you will not get information of what is going on on the surface, you will not get very good information to be used by a chemical engineer because there are a lot of gradients. Then rather, when you have made some uh, explorative tests that you know there is a fish in there, then to scale up quickly to the pilot size, meaning the full industrial mass velocity, and then do the so-called in situ studies to, to really study what uh, is going on on the surface and use this method to characterize the spent kind of samples. This is much more effective, uh, uh, but it's also, of course, much more uh, uh, expensive. But our conclusion is that, that time is uh, very much money. So uh, uh, if you believe in what you're doing, you should make the jump into to this rather than staying for decays and uh, studying things. Uh, in the uh, bench cave. It means that in the process from science to dollars, not only need we need, uh, need we to integrate the basic research with the applied research and development, but 
we, uh, you, you need to, to, in an industrial environment, to link this very much, not the least, to marketing. Many places, uh, uh, in particular in Eastern Europe, they have the tradition first to do basic research in the universities and the uh, academy institutes, then they have uh, design institutes making applied research and development design. You have the linear model and you will never get through. So you have to be able to manage all these steps at the same time. <coughs> it means that uh, at a, in a small company, uh, located in a small country, uh, we put a lot of emphasis in, at an early stage to create two networks. First, a knowledge network to universities, uh, consultants, and so on, and also the commercial network, to, in particular to the, what we call the first sophisticated client that we get feedback immediately to what is needed and also of course the, the, the person who should suffer from having the first industrial plant. This is exactly the answer to the question yesterday uh, why we are publishing. We cannot establish a knowledge network without publishing ourselves. It's a, it's a trait. If you visit a university, if you just ask about information and you can't give anything uh, yourself, you will get a lunch, uh, maybe a free lunch <coughs> in the faculty club, and that's it. You have to be an active player, and it's much better to discuss with people than to read literature. First, literature is boring, and then it is outdated. The better the, the data, the more outdated they are because uh, the good refereeing process, uh, and so on. But by uh, having a network, you can share visions with the people who can discuss with them what they are thinking and doing in a couple of years. And that type of way, you gain a lot of time, and that's the reason we do this. For the academic research, unfortunately, uh, there are a few trends which are very dangerous. Uh, 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 academic research is forced to do these things. The fashionable research, that will uh, remove the tenacity. You will, uh, you will change fashion. Now uh, it's oxidative coupling. Maybe to further back before synthesis, so on. Non applicable applied research, you try to do relevant research and you have no client. So uh, it's uh, without knowledge of the practice and capability. And then uh, it all boils down to railroad research for milestones. You have to describe the milestones. Uh, all of most your results in the applications to the funding. So, uh, uh, and if you get a new idea, you better uh, use that for the next application rather to jump ahead. Uh, now that was a, 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 a wrong a translation. A trunk research, that's a trunk from, from an elephant. But uh, you can also call it siphoning research. And I forgot a, 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 an overhead showing an elephant on a, on a, on a railroad. Uh, but I am afraid that if we are not changing things for the conditions for the academic research, we will see a lot of elephants on the railroad. And that is not very productive. That will give no courage, no curiosity driven research. If we are to go ahead in catalysis, whether in industry or in academic research, we need much more uh, curiosity driven research. We need much more courage, courage to do research in areas which are not fashionable and to stay on that and to make fewer uh, publications but better publications. We need to go further out, not stay on the cliff, but sail out to see what's uh, behind the horizon. And that is a French uh, quote. Now Michel is not here anymore, so he could have translated it, but it means something that taking the horizon as the limits, as the cliff, it's a big uh, mistake because uh, uh, there's always something behind the horizon. So uh, rather than being on a train with milestones and uh, an elephant, it's much better to be on a boat and go west uh, towards the horizon. And if we have uh, John as a navigator, I think the sunset will look more beautiful than the first sunset. Thank you very much.